Hello everyone, my name is Minty Ledger and I'm the Interim Executive Director for Cambridge University Health Partners. I'd like to welcome you to our fifth Cambridge Biomedical Campus on virtual tour event. Since we moved our talks online in the summer, we have had hundreds of people tuning in to hear from the best and brightest clinicians, researchers and academics from across Cambridge. They have learned of the science behind the early detection of cancer, the challenge of delivering major projects and the hope of new treatments. All of our talks, including last month's from Billy Boyle from Alstone Medical, are now available on the CBC YouTube channel. This evening, I have the privilege of introducing Professor Andreas Floto and Kirsty Hill, who will be explaining how digital health research is empowering people living with cystic fibrosis. Andreas is Professor of Respiratory Biology at the University of Cambridge, Director of the UK Cystic Fibrosis Innovation Hub, Co-Director of the Cambridge Centre for AI and Medicine, and Honorary Consultant at Royal Papworth Hospital. Kirsty Hill is the Managing Director of Magic Bullet Limited and a digital healthcare innovator. She leads the team responsible for delivering the technical solution for the Project Breathe clinical evaluation. As usual throughout this evening's talk, if you are watching through Zoom, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A box, and these will then be addressed at the end of the talk. We will do our best to include any comments made by those on YouTube Live, but please don't be too disappointed if yours is not included, as we often have a very chatty audience. And finally, to reassure you all, you won't be seen or heard throughout the event, but it will be recorded to be accessed afterwards on our website and the CBC YouTube channel. So let me hand over to Andreas and Kirsty, and also take the opportunity to wish you a very Merry Christmas from all of us at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So uh, thank you, Minty and Jill and Tony for the opportunity for us to share with you some of our research into digital health uh, applied to cystic fibrosis as part of the Cystic Fibrosis Innovation Hub uh, based in Cambridge. So in order to introduce uh, as, as, as background then, so cystic fibrosis is the most a common life limiting genetic condition in the Western world. And uh, it results in the buildup of very thick secretions in a lot of organs, but particularly the lungs where it can block the airways. And that leads to chronic bacterial infection, repeated inflammation and progressive lung damage and unfortunately eventually death. And the genetics of cystic fibrosis were discovered just over 30 years ago in two landmark publications uh, in science, made the front cover here. This little kid is now this man with CF, which in itself is remarkable. And CF is caused by mutations in a channel called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator or CFTR, which normally uh, uh, provides a route for uh, secretion of chloride and bicarbonate in the airways. So in cystic fibrosis, if you look into the airways of the lungs, the amount of fluid is regulated by the secretion of chloride and the reabsorption of sodium and water from the lumen into uh, the cells. And normally this is regulated, so chloride is secreted and sodium is reabsorbed. In CF, chloride can't be secreted, lots of sodium and hence water is reabsorbed. And that leads to dehydration of the air surface of the airway, the collapse of the mucociliary escalator, which normally clears secretions from the airways and the development of chronic infection. So we're living in remarkable times with cystic fibrosis because there are developments of novel therapies that restore CFTR function, at least in part. And the, the most common mutation in CF called 508 DEL causes a misfolding of the protein and that leads to it being trapped into in the inside of the cell, in this case, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And so very little of the channel gets to the surface and hence these cells aren't able to secrete chloride. So with these drugs, the channel can refold because they act as chaperones and can escape the ER 
and make it to the surface of the cells and partially restore CF uh, uh, function, CFTL function and chloride secretion. And so we're seeing the development now of small molecules that can correct the misfolding and also correct the problem of gating. So channels, the other mutations in CF can cause problems with gating so that the channel gets to the surface of the cell but can't open and release chloride. And these drugs then can open the channel up and allow secretion of chloride. And in fact, the triple therapies, which are now being rolled out across the UK, are a combination of the correctors and potentiators and will reach about 90% uh, uh, of individuals with cystic fibrosis. So is CF sorted then? Well, these new therapies can restore CFTR function significantly, but not to normal levels. They improve lung function sometimes dramatically, and they reduce the requirement for emergency courses of antibiotics. However, people with CF continue to be chronically infected with multidrug resistant bacteria, and unfortunately death uh, is due to antibiotic failure. We just don't have enough antibiotics uh, to treat these infections. The damage to the lungs is permanent, and these therapies are a treatment and not a cure. They can't restore the damaged lungs. Uh, and people with CF continue to suffer from the acute pulmonary exacerbations, these sudden, sudden clinical deteriorations that require antibiotics either in hospital or at home. So these were the motivations then for us setting up a strategic partnership between the University of Cambridge and the UK CF Trust to found the CF Innovation Hub based in Cambridge. And our mission very simply is to tackle the remaining bigger uh, uh, challenges in cystic fibrosis, and specifically those that also have a global impact in other conditions. So within the Innovation Hub, we focused on generating fragment-based or structure-guided antibiotic discovery driven by artificial intelligence. And we've been fortunate to collaborate with Tom Blundell, Julian Parkhill, and until um, his untimely death, tragically, a few weeks ago, Chris Abel, in order to deliver this transformational uh, pipeline of novel antibiotic therapy. We're also focused on understanding how we can use stem cells in order to provide cellular therapy to restore damaged lungs. Uh, so we take cells from the blood, make them into lung cells, and the expectation or the hope eventually is to be able to use these to repopulate uh, damaged lungs. And finally, we've been pushing the boundaries of digital health and machine learning in order to provide uh, real uh, benefit to individuals uh, with CF. And it's this last bit uh, that's the focus of today's uh, talk. So of the two aspects of our digital uh, health program, We've been fortunate to be working with Mahela van der Schaar over the last five or six years now on using registry data from individuals with CF in order to learn more about the condition and provide actionable intelligence to both individuals with CF and their um, clinical teams. And so um, Mahela's lab has, has developed world leading cutting edge methodologies motivated by the problems of CF uh, which include fully automated machine learning uh, programs, uh, ways in which we can group patients based on their temporal trajectories. We've been able to understand competing risks, so the prediction of one thing may be irrelevant if something else is going to cause a problem before that happens, and the ability to use Bayesian uh, methods in order to have confidence about the difference in people's trajectories. So this is all really exciting stuff. And as a result of the success of this collaboration, Mahela and I uh, decided to uh, uh, launch a Cambridge Center for AI in Medicine, uh, which is uh, gratefully funded uh, by uh, GSK and AZ to really tackle some fundamental problems in biomedicine from biomedical discovery to analyzing big complex omics data sets uh, to delivering precision medicine and uh, to design new next generation clinical trials. And we're fortunate that the, um, the, the center is now uh, up and running and we hope to have an inauguration in January the 22nd. For today though, we're gonna focus on the other parts of our digital health program, which involves home monitoring and CF. 
So what, what's the point of home monitoring? Why bother? Well, actually, one of the big impacts on uh, the lives of individuals with CF is the time spent doing treatments and attending hospital. And so the expectation was that digital health might provide a, a mechanism of only bringing people in to the clinic when required. We recognize the importance of trying to identify these sudden clinical deteriorations or exacerbations before patients notice. So early warning of clinical deterioration and hence uh, the opportunity to intervene sooner. The, the ability to provide feedback at a, a really um, a timely fashion in order to promote uh, adherence, to uh, allow people to understand what treatments uh, worked for them, and hopefully to reinforce positive behaviour. And finally, by using digital health and home monitoring, we thought it would be a, excellent in order to work out what medicines uh, worked for that individual and which ones could be safely stopped. And given the triple therapies, these transformational new, new drugs in cystic fibrosis, um, the, 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 remove, the safe removal of other therapies is becoming kind of really important at the moment. And finally, by minimizing the contact with uh, hospitals, we were hoping to reduce the risk of infection. So in CF, it's very well recognized that actually being in a CF unit or in the hospital is a significant risk for catching multidrug resistant infections. And we've seen that over a number of different bugs. Um, and obviously this year, we've, we've been uh, dealing with another infectious uh, risk, uh, which is obviously coronavirus. And finally, by providing home monitoring, we thought we'd be able to empower individuals with CF to take control of their own disease. So the journey has been long and I'll just rush, uh, I'll just rush through the timelines for you. And so we started almost 10 years ago now with a small pilot study in 15 adults with CF in a single CF center uh, with a six month study. And uh, we're grateful to Karen, Julian, and, and uh, so Judy, Karen, and Kevin uh, for driving this study. And the success of that led to the CF Smart Care uh, study, which was uh, seven uh, centers in the, in the US, in the UK, I'm sorry, uh, with just under 150 adults with CF. And again, a six month study of daily uh, home monitoring. And this was funded by the CF Trust and by Papworth Hospital. And again, Judy and Karen, MM uh, involved in uh, running the study and we're very grateful to Janet Allen from the CF Trust for driving this program forward. The data from that uh, we were able to uh, use and analyze uh, using the machine learning expertise of John Wynn in Microsoft Research. You know, John is a, a group leader in Microsoft Research but also happens to have cystic fibrosis and we share a PhD student, uh, Damien here, um, and uh, it's this data uh, that I'm going to be describing in, in a second. So the success of Smart Care allowed us to uh, to do two things. First, to run uh, it, to uh, um, extend uh, Smart Care into the pediatric population, and this study was uh, led by Jane Davis in Imperial College, um, but also to operationalize uh, home monitoring as a clinical improvement project. Uh, uh, termed Project Breathe, and Kirsty's going to talk about that uh, next. So in the telemed study, we uh, asked patients to uh, monitor their activity, their peak flow and their FEV1, their lung function, their oxygen sats and their weight, as well as symptom diaries, and collect a sputum sample on a daily basis. The data coming out of this kind of collection uh, it, 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 it is shown here, and this is a timeline, uh, and uh, the courses of intravenous antibiotics are shown in green. And I think you can appreciate a number of things. So the first thing is that the data is really complex. It's very noisy. It's very hard to interpret. We also learned that there was huge enthusiasm for home monitoring amongst the population, but we recognized that a much larger study was required. We also, given the fact that this was 10 years ago, relied on uh, wired connections to PCs to upload the data. And this was a disaster. We recognized that actually connectivity of the sensors was critical in order to allow us to implement this at scale. 
The one thing we did learn, which was much, much, much later, was thanks to being able to use the physiological data with the sputum samples, we can now be confident that there are changes in bacteria and chemicals within sputum associated with the start of acute pulmonary exacerbations. And this has raised the potential uh, for us to discover novel bi biomarkers uh, 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 in CF. So SmartCare CF then was a multi-center feasibility study. There were seven CF centers here listed, uh, and we aim to recruit 150 adults with CF. So this time we used a smartphone to upload the data via Bluetooth. You can see the, tech, the, the, the tech's a bit more advanced now. We have activity trackers again. We have measures of lung function, of, uh, of oxygenation, of weight, of symptom diaries. And again, uh, we collected the sputum uh, in home freezers. So eventually we enrolled 147 subjects. We have 135 subjects with at least four months of data. And here you can see each of the participants of the study um, over time. And you can see that a lot of them drop out uh, over, over the course of the study, and I'll come back to that later. But um, up to nine data points uh, were uploaded a, a day in green, and you can see how that's varied over time. So we had a, a, a number of we had a, a number of uh, acute pulmonary exacerbations during the study. So the majority of patients had at least one exacerbation, which was good in terms of uh, developing a predictive algorithm. We recognised that the system worked technically, so the sensors worked, the data upload worked, and the software worked, but it could have been a lot lot better. Generally, the, ex the, the acceptance of home monitoring was, was really good and positive. So most people felt reassured, it drove behavioral change and it inevitably informed clinical decision-making, although that wasn't part of the study. We had a few individuals that, that developed a lot of anxiety and felt that the hassle of daily monitoring uh, was, was too much. But overall, the vast majority of people felt it was helpful or very helpful. Importantly, though, we had the data now to generate uh, predictive algorithms using machine learning and also to begin to understand how often the measurements need to be taken because we, we recognise that we don't need daily monitoring. Uh, but in order to understand uh, uh, um, what was going on, we needed this for the study. And also it allowed us to begin to think how we could change outpatient care using home monitoring. So what did the CF uh, smart care data tell us? Well, this is an example of the kind of data that you see under current clinical conditions. So we see lung function on the days that an individual with CF attends clinic, and we only get uh, additional measures, in this case CRP, or as an inflammatory marker in the blood, uh, when they're unwell uh, and receiving intravenous antibiotics. So just compare that to the richness of the data that we see uh, with um, uh, with smart care home monitoring. So here you can see lung function and oxygen saturations, and notice how the signal seems to change well before the start of the intravenous antibiotics. And we also had pulse rate and activity and weight and sleep quality and cough and wellness and scores. And how can we use then this home monitoring data to improve CF care? Well, one of the first tasks was to, um, to use machine learning to define the start of an acute pulmonary exacerbation. So the problem is as follows, that in, for example, in this patient, they begin to feel unwell here, but they start antibiotics with a long delay. And in contrast, another patient, for example, will start to decline here and then rapidly uh, get antibiotic treatment. And so the task, the problem that we used unsupervised machine learning to solve was to be able to align these deterioration curves so that they matched up. So in this case, uh, long delay before treatment, shorter delay before treatment, and very short delay before treatment, we use machine learning to align them up so we get a big signal change averaging to the point at which the exacerbation started. And if we do that, we find for the very first time we can look into what an acute pulmonary exacerbation looks like. And these are the characteristic profiles. So you see the signal changes at this point here, some a, a bit beforehand. And then what you see is a characteristic decline and then a partial improvement, and then followed by a terminal decline only corrected by intravenous antibiotics. 
In fact, what we found was that there were three different types of exacerbations. Class one, which looked like the general case I showed you before, so a deterioration, partial recovery, and then terminal decline. Class two, where the symptoms go down, but actually the lung function isn't affected at all. And class three, where it looks like they're just recovering from the previous exacerbation, and then there's a sudden permanent decline. And this kind of information has given us really important insights into what's causing pulmonary exacerbations. So using this data then, we were able to train a, a machine learning algorithm to issue a prediction of the likelihood of future exacerbation. And so in this case here, you can see for this patient, the exacerbation starts here and our predictor correctly identifies the exacerbation and uh, pings off a, a signal. And the same with this chap here, who uh, begins to decline and then the uh, algorithm shoots off a signal uh, uh, appropriately detecting uh, the onset of a future exacerbation. And in fact, the performance of these algorithms is very good. Um, and we get about a 10 day uh, advanced warning of, a, of an exacerbation compared to uh, kind of conventional therapy. We can also look at the relative contributions of symptoms as well as the, 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 the sensors uh, to build the best possible uh, algorithm. So now we're in a position where we can start to think how we can change clinic and so conventionally then we have individuals who have routine clinical appointments every few weeks. There'll be a call from the patient to say they're feeling unwell and that triggers the initiation of antibiotic therapy and then they revert back to this regular treatment. So now with home monitoring, we've been able to stretch out the gap between treatments, sorry, the gap between clinics. And obviously with COVID, we've been able to, to, to use the home monitoring in order to support uh, video clinics. And now we hope eventually that the algorithm will alert um, to the requirement for intravenous antibiotics rather than the patient. We're still in the process of, of finalizing the algorithm and then planning to test that next year in a clinical trial. And then we can revert to this much longer period uh, between uh, clinic reviews. The other issue is by using home monitoring, we can solve the other problem in CF, well, it's not a problem, it's a great success story that the number of people with CF in the UK is increasing by about 250 a year, and that's before triple therapy came on board. So we can anticipate a much larger annual increase in the population, and yet the CF center capacity is finite, and these are shown here. So we hope that by using home monitoring, we can expand, we can have fewer centers with more patients. As I mentioned before, the safe withdrawal of medicines while once people are established on uh, the triple therapy. So clearly this is very rich data, which we hope to combine with the patient registry data um, uh, curated by the CF Trust uh, to provide a, a research um, uh, facility uh, uh, for, uh, for um, all UK researchers. And by providing a platform that we know works, we can then ask the question whether new sensors may add additional uh, uh, predictive value. So the, the success of SmartCare allowed us to uh, successfully uh, bid for funding from a number of organizations, principally the USCF Foundation. And we're in currently just starting our year two of a three-year program of operationalizing this as Project Breathe. And so we've done a lot in terms of refining the predictive algorithm. We've begun to roll out the, the platform to uh, more patients at Papworth uh, and uh, capturing all of Wales and hopefully all of Scotland uh, over the next year or so. And we've begun to innovate with new sensors. So just give you an idea of what home monitoring can do. This is uh, comparing patients six months before and six months after starting a uh, treatment. This is before lockdown and before triple therapy. And you can see that the rate of decline of lung function is reduced, the loss of weight is reduced, and the amount of antibiotics required by patients on home monitoring is reduced compared to what they were before. So we're very excited by the opportunities of using Project Breathe as a platform for evaluating new sensors. And these include a radar-based uh, bedside uh, measure 
of respiratory rate and chest wall movement. This is in collaboration with Circadia. And also the opportunity to use machine learning on voice analysis to be able to detect early, early changes associated with pulmonary exacerbations in collaboration with Sunday Health. So that then is where we're heading with home monitoring in CF. Our guiding principles are that actually the primary uh, uh, motivation is empowering individuals to take control of their own CF and it's their data, it's not our data. The platforms need to be device agnostic so we can plug and play with any uh, sensor. It needs to be safe and, uh, and that's the reason why we're going for a clinical trial evaluation of the uh, predictive algorithm next year. And with the patient's consent, anonymized data uh, to be available to all researchers in CF. So I'll stop there just to thank the individuals involved from my lab, uh, uh, Judy, Karen, Damien, MM and Josie. Uh, our partners in the CF uh, service at Papworth, Charlie, Sam and Catherine, uh, the CF Trust in particular, Janet Allen and the steering committee and all of the, uh, the PIs uh, from SmartCare, uh, John Wynn at Microsoft, Kirsty, of course, at Magic Bullet and within Microsoft Digital, we're very grateful for Dave, Jerry and Tom for their help and obviously our funding bodies. So I'll stop there and hand over to Kirsty uh, to give you uh, an update on where we are with the Project Breathe platform. Good evening and thank you for having me. I'm Kirsty Hill, Director of Magic Bullets, a digital health social enterprise. We have a small team with a big ambition, aspiring to develop great digital tools to improve the quality of life and outcomes for people living with cystic fibrosis. I myself have a son with CF and he is of course my source of inspiration and drive to see a tangible impact made in this space. I've been lucky enough to be involved in this project for a couple of years now, working alongside Andreas and his teams at both the Royal Papworth Hospital and the University of Cambridge, as well as the other members of our consortium from the CF Trust, Microsoft Research, and most importantly, people with CF. My role in this amazing collaboration is delivering the technical solution that underpins the research project, the remote monitoring platform. From the get-go, we've designed with a production-ready solution in mind. Although a proof of concept could have served its purpose for a research project, for us it's always been about ensuring that these tools will get into the hands of as many people with CF as possible, as soon as they're proven safe to do so. The user interface is designed to be simple and intuitive, helping people easily capture meaningful health data. Easy to consume trends and graphs help make sense of that data. Seeing longitudinal trends comparing, for example, lung function in context of weight or resting heart rate gives new insights and empowers and enables proactive health management and earlier self-intervention. Rapid data capture with Bluetooth-enabled devices simplifies recording of measures like spirometry and oximetry. Ecosystems like Fitbit and Apple Health enable direct synchronisation of data from wearables and watches. We know that the simpler we can make capturing the data, the more likely people are to do it. With secure data to cloud synchronization, our solution not only makes it easy to capture and store data, but also puts the users in control of owning their own data and consenting with who and where they share it. That might mean sharing with their clinical team, enabling remote virtual clinics, maybe with a research project like Project Breathe, and maybe with other existing vital databases, such as the UK CF registry. It will always be their data and their choice. Back in March, whilst we were successfully managing our pilot rollout at Royal Papworth Hospital, things took an interesting turn when I received a text from the NHS Coronavirus Service identifying my son as clinically extremely vulnerable. The text asked him to stay indoors and shield for at least 12 weeks, staying at least two metres or three steps away from us, the other members of his household, and not to share a bathroom or a kitchen or even go in the garden. And whilst we all have our lockdown stories and I'm not here to bore you with mine, it does help give context to the pivot because not only were we concerned and uncertain about the weeks and months ahead for us as a family, I was also acutely aware that we weren't the only household getting that text that day. As a consortium, we very quickly agreed that whilst Project Breathe was still an evaluation, it had the potential to make a difference to many people at this uncertain time. 
So while as a nation, we all got to grips with online school, remote working and forever searching for a quiet corner to make another video call, my amazing team rolled up their sleeves and got down to the development. Core focus for us was how could we quickly but safely distribute the platform and app to more people and more clinics. In an uncertain and concerning time, when people with CF were asked not to attend clinic because it was considered unsafe to do so, being able to monitor and manage their cystic fibrosis from home while shielding was more important than ever. At that time, the platform was designed to share data with just one clinic, and so scaling up whilst ensuring consent and security were not compromised was essential. We put the app on the app source to broaden reach, but we were mindful that it needed to connect to more than just the devices we were issuing trial participants, as not everyone would have that kit at home. It was an intense time and I'm extremely proud of how rapidly we turned it around so that clinics could press ahead and focus on rolling out the solution to more people as quickly as possible. Project VLAP has been downloaded over a thousand times and the remote monitoring platform now supports four clinics in the UK and we're also in talks with a team in Canada. Feedback from our users, both people with CF using the app and their care teams using the clinician dashboard to support remote consultations has been overwhelmingly positive. Receiving comments like these, I can see when my lung function is good or bad and adjust my lifestyle accordingly. I can see what makes it better. Or I have discovered that my lung function is higher after going for shorter runs every day as opposed to fewer longer runs. These comments are rewarding and encouraging, but they also validate the success of the project and solution. But we're not done yet. We're always listening to the feedback we receive, and we will continue to ensure that our remote monitoring platform is the best it can be. We have a long list of ideas and suggestions from our users on how we can do just that. At the same time, of course, we get to continue working on the exciting new development for the Project Breathe machine learning exacerbation predictor. Knowing how empowering and enabling the app already is and imagining the shift if we could confidently detect and alert users to a decline in their health several days sooner than we currently can, encouraging them to proactively seek support and treatment with all of the benefits that will bring. It could be amazing. And so for me, there are silver linings to the shifts we are all experiencing, and maybe a much needed shakeup to the management of chronic health conditions is one of them. I really hope that these changes and remote monitoring are here to stay, and platforms like Breathe will enable this shift to become sustainable. If I reflect on the topic we are here to speak of today, how can digital health research empower those with cystic fibrosis? For me, the answer is in ensuring that research is translated into tangible results. I think Project Read exemplifies this. It builds on the previous success of studies like SmartCare CF, and it takes that research, those findings, and the user feedback, and it's created a condition-centric solution that works. And not just because there's cool technology, but because people with CF are at the very heart of every decision. The research to understand what people want and need and designing for them is what elevates this project and delivers results. I would just like to say a quick thank you for the really long list of people who are dedicated to and pivotal to the success of this project. It's a real privilege to work with them all. And of course, thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. I'd just like to say thank you to um, both Andreas and Kirsty for those um, that wonderful presentation. That's really great to hear the developments that's been made. Um, in this a very complex area. So um, I've had a few questions that have come in so far. So if anyone has any questions, if you just want to enter them into the Q&A box, we will pick them up and ask them to both Kirsty and to Andreas as we go through. But I think kind of one of the first things that one of the people that have, have asked already is what's the end goal do you feel ultimately of the of this project and of the work that you're doing that you're both doing it kind of goes to both of you it's difficult with two people to look at so um whoever wants to go first <laughs> do you want to start andreas it's, it's... Oh. oh you're on mute Andrew. yeah no I, okay um so so the end goal for us is to have a um completely passive sensing system for individuals with cf so without thinking about it, they're able to pick up enough physiological signals to provide a confident prediction of how they're gonna be. And once you do that, 
then you basically break the mold of uh, current healthcare delivery. You allow individuals to live lives without being slaves to clinic appointments uh, or excessive uh, interventions and allow each individual to optimize their own treatments because they can see themselves whether things are better or worse when they take X or they take Y or where they remove X or they remove Y. So, so for us, it, it's providing the information to allow people to, with CF to, as I say, take control of their own, uh, their, own um, their own health. From a research perspective though, the insights provided by the high frequency granular data that we're getting now is, 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 is mind blowing. Uh, in terms of understanding the biology behind the clinical deteriorations. And that's providing us with enormous insights into how we can think about new interventions and new treatments. And so, so there is a kind of research aspect um, as well as a, a kind of intervention aspect. Thanks, Chris. Kirsty? Yeah, I mean, obviously um, having a child with CF, so he's, he's 16 years now and then he's going through that transition into caring for himself and managing his own care, um, which is an interesting time. I mean, any parent will know that any teenager transitioning into adult, being an adult is interesting enough. Um, so, so knowing that, you know, the tools we're developing could lead to um, a state where, like I say, just a smartphone, um, sorry, a smartwatch, which we don't know what sensors will be in those in, in two or three years time. It's all a person with CF needs to do. They just need to wear their watch, connect it to the app and then go about their daily life. And, you know, if their health is showing signals of deterioration, they can be alerted to that. They can seek timely treatment. And again, the intervention should be shorter, more effective and life carries on again much more quickly. So it's, it's about empowering and, and, and normalizing as much as possible, but ensuring that's obviously done really safely um, so that you know, we're not losing those gains won by having you know, all of the interventions that currently are in place and all of the care that people do to stay well. Obviously we want to, to keep people well um, with a much less onerous um, routine. I guess it's all about the quality of life, isn't it? When in, in that kind of interaction, because yes, teenagers, can be special in many ways um, and kind of see the different challenges that um, uh, that they that they're kind of presented to them in, in, in with different kind of attitudes and different their priorities change is probably a, a good way of looking at it. Um, so what do you think what change and advance has made the biggest change do you think to patients and their and, and their quality of life as part of this project? I mean so from my perspective I um I'm very lucky to see the feedback forms that come in. So obviously we, we, we generate um, feedback so that we can understand how users feel about the solution, what's useful, what isn't useful, so that we can learn and make sure we iterate it and, and do build it with them in mind. And I think the condition centric nature of what we have is, is like I said earlier, is what makes it really work. Um, and if I'm honest, what's interesting is that it highlights there is no one size fits all because I, I don't see the same response in every feedback form as to what's great. So for some people, longitudinal data, some people love the data and they want to examine it and, and make their own decisions. For other people, knowing that that data is there so that enables a more informed call when that time comes around is enough for them. Um, and, and also the, the new features people ask for are always different. And so for some people, um, the fact that they're they're able to save an 80 mile round trip, not going to clinic for their, um, for their just routine clinic visit. Um, it's, it's always different what people call out as their highlight or benefit they're seeing so far. So I think really it's the, the individualized nature of, of it not being one size fits all, but actually you know, helping people in different ways that I love. It's kind of that bespoke side to it, isn't it? Yes, Andreas, the same question to you. Yeah, no, so I think, I, I think we've, we've had enormous challenges this year where clearly there has been a risk, obviously a perceived risk and a real risk of normal service, if you like, uh, for people coming into clinic. And so we flipped to video clinics very quickly, and yet we have incomplete data in order to help make decisions uh, about 
you know, collectively with individuals with CF about treatments. And so, you know, we're grateful to the, U to the UK government for and the NHS England for rolling out the spirometers to a large proportion of the CF population, but spirometry is a late uh, signal of clinical deterioration. And so we recognize that a, lot, that a lot of people's health with CF has been adversely affected by the pandemic. And this suite of sensors and hopefully the algorithm will allow kind of safe deployment of, uh, of video clinics uh, for people with CF. So we'll have the benefits of reducing risk without the downsides of, uh, of incomplete data. I think um, one of the interesting things about the pandemic has been the, the kind of increasing amount of people who've been using um, video call, calls to um, in, in all in all kind of treatments and um, for various outpatient appointments. Is there anything else that, um, that has changed during the pandemic about CF care? Um, and how many of those changes do you think will last whenever we kind of move into the next stage of um, hopefully post COVID and when, once the vaccines has been rolled out everywhere, what, what kind of things do you think people have, have done and, and you can learn from that have actually made a difference? I think Kirsty's probably a better place. I mean, I think um, for, for us, it's really seeing that when, when everybody had to have remote clinics, there was a stark contrast between those who had been on the evaluation and they had um, historical data and those who, who hadn't. And, and like Andrea said, um, very quickly, the NHS did a rollout and home spirometry, so people had access to be able to, to, to check that data point at home, but it is just one data point and it, it takes us back to that blunt decision making. Um, whereas, you know, the holistic um, approach and, and view of a person tells us so much more. And I think really for us, it just validated what we were doing because um, it was easier for clinicians to um, make decisions if they had more project read data available to them. Um, so, and certainly again, um, you know, going through new feedback forms today and, and lots of people say it's definitely helped them feel safer. Obviously it's, you know, I, I know I mentioned in my video, you know, that, that text that said you're clinically extremely vulnerable is, is quite shocking to receive and actually people's lives changed overnight. And it's, we can all imagine um, what that felt like, but it, you know, it's, it, it would bring an extra layer of, of concern for those people who were um, already managing their health, you know, on a day-to-day on -day basis, there, there's a new threat. Um, and, and getting to see their care team who then used to looking after them and making sure and reassuring that they're well, they can't do. Um, so again, knowing that we were able to offer that reassurance um, safely was, was great. Um, you know, and, and lots of people on, let's say on the feedback forms we're currently receiving are commenting on the reassurance of not having to go and, and mix to be able to get to access that care. Um, so so I, in all honesty, it's just validated the great work um, that, that's going on. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that's just coming through the chat is, um, in terms of testing the predictive algorithm, is the plan to have a control arm to see what the differences are in the wellness stroke changes in FEV1 stroke antibiotic use? Now, I'm not sure which of you wants to field that question. Well, so maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take this one. So Thanks, exactly right. So um, the plans for, for next year um, are to do exactly that. So we'll basically randomize people to home monitoring alone or home monitoring plus the predictive algorithm. And in terms of outcomes, we need to measure a lot of things. We need to measure the amount of time spent at a sub optimal health uh, state, um, the amount of antibiotics given the changes in lung function and weight over that period, the number of emergency calls to the service. And all of those things are providing us with information about the utility of the uh, predictive algorithm uh, and also the, the, the safety uh, of, of utilizing it. I think the questions about, you know, will it mean more antibiotics? Well, it might do or it might not do, but I think the key thing is maintaining lung health because we're dealing with a chronic condition uh, and we, we need to have a time scale of decades rather than just a few months. Uh, and certainly the data from the US is that outcomes in clinics that use more antibiotics are better than in clinics that use less antibiotics. So, you know, in, in contrast to antibiotic studentship that's 
stewardship uh, issues, which are obviously very important. Um, in, in CF, it may be that actually we, we, we may be undertreating a proportion of individuals with CF. Okay. Um, I suppose slightly related to the kind of the data question is, how do patients um, feel about having their um, information, even though it's, uh, um, and I can never say this, but anonymized, yes, there we go, anonymized, um, being stored online. Do you ever get patients who opt out of Project Brief when they're put because they're worried about um, security of their data at all? Well, well maybe I'll, I'll, I'll I'll hand over to Kirsty in a minute, but um, but you know I think we've been very clear, and I think Kirsty mentioned this in her thing that the, the, the data belongs to the person with CF, and they choose to share it with the with the center, and they choose to share it in an anonymized form with with the research team. So at, at, if they want to just use the app themselves, great. If they want to share it in order to support uh, remote remote health monitoring, great. And if they want to contribute to research, great. But it is up to the individual. And in the eventual operationalized uh, software, we're hoping to have a simple toggle bar to toggle on and off these, these features. So it is really up to the individual. They can change their mind whenever they want. Sorry, I'll hand over to Kirsty. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, just building on that, obviously, we're very mindful that our solution is safe and secure and, and it's NHS compliant. And, and again, um, you know, building that from the outset so that it's not a, you know, a proof of concept. So being able to productionize any feature as soon as it's proven safe is really important. So, you know, that's how we were able to put the app on the app store. Um, as Andrea said, you can, anybody can download and use the app without being connected to a clinic and without sharing their data. Um, they can benefit from, you know, starting to track their own trends and, and get the benefits of, of seeing their own changes. Um, you know, with the learnings we've got from the, the machine learning, it's why we've started to put uh, graphs in context so that people can look at their lung function next to their resting heart rate or their weight because there may be patterns they can see for themselves um, to maybe make changes so we know people um, will do more exercise or, or eat more or rest more depending on what they need and, and that um, instant response to collecting the data empowers them to do it in a timely fashion rather than waiting for their um, sort of eight weekly appointment um, so Absolutely, the kind of data security and, and ownership, patient ownership of their data um, has been you know, core to everything we've done and will continue to do so. So um, as Andrea said, people will be able to consent with who and where they share it um, all through the app. Um, kind of slightly linked to the, the technology side, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but, but jumping around between um, question topics here, but is it worth kind of how is the technology helping people with their mental health? I know that kind of one of the, the, the things that people really do sometimes struggle with, the fact that the feeling that they're being isolated um, from family and friends. And it's been a tough year for all of us in terms of that kind of thing. But how, how do you see the technology helping on the mental health um, aspects? Um, it's an interesting one because um, for those who love analyzing the data, let's say they're getting a real-time response from being able to see it, capture it and, and check that they're okay. Um, that won't be what everybody wants to do. And again, that's okay. Um, but I think knowing that just taking, and it, honestly, it takes sort of 90 seconds a day to capture that data, knowing that that's done and it's kind of being taken care of, it means that the care team can check in and see that data remotely and make sure that you are well, whether you can or can't get to clinic. So I think it's just knowing that it's being managed is, is helpful. Um, there, there definitely will be individuals who would like to return to clinic because that's their preferred mode of, of speaking to their team. Um, and again, you know, we were talking earlier about the number of people with CF growing and, and the clinics becoming overwhelmed. And, and for those who love remote monitoring and choose to do it and continue doing it, that's great because that frees up the space for those who would prefer to be in clinic to do that. So um, again, I think it will fit people's model of mental health and, and what they hope for. Um, one comment I did read earlier was somebody saying actually at a time where we're wearing masks so much, the benefit of a video consultation meant not wearing a mask and it felt more normal in a, in a strange way because you know that, that barrier had gone. So I, I think again, it's, it's depending on um, how people choose to use the solution and for themselves, what suits them best. So I, I agree uh, completely with, with what Kirsty said. What I, what I would say is that when I mean, we're very acutely aware of the 
the mental health toil of uh, impact of what's gone on over the last few months and, and actually more generally with having CF. And um, there are opportunities to build on the platform that, uh, that we've developed um, in order to specifically address that issue. We, we're not there yet. We, it is something that we're thinking about doing and particularly the, the sound biops, the voice biopsies I was talking about, the AI analysis of, uh, of voice uh, has actually been used um, in clinical trials to pick up uh, um, disorders of, of, of mental health, uh, depression and so forth. And so while we, we haven't got uh, immediate plans to do so, there are opportunities to build and layer on uh, other aspects to to address what is a really important subject. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, kind of leading on a little bit from that, as, um, I guess the, the kind of the next thing I was thinking about was what can digital not replace those for? Uh, sorry, <laughs> trying to get the words out. What can digital not replace for those who have cystic fibrosis? What's the boundaries almost of what uh, of what Project Breathe can do? Or is there not? I mean, again, and Andreas is definitely better positioned to speak to this. I mean, the main thing I would say is, is everything we're trying to do is, is always about decision support tools. So, so nothing's ever going to say, you know, you have to start this treatment in terms of the technology. Um, it's never going to be that prescriptive, but it's a decision support tool for the person with CF mm -hmm. as well as the clinicians. And I think um, that's the beauty of it. Um, we're not trying to replace anything. We're trying to empower and enable everybody um, involved in the care of that person. Yeah, I, I think I think that's right. It provides reassurance that things are good. And uh, in in the planned kind of um, surfacing of, of, of the algorithm, we're going to have a kind of green school, which is things are good, carry on as you are. An amber school where hold on a sec, things may be not right or they're on the way down and everyone's got a management plan that they can go to with that. And then there's red, which is, you know, things aren't looking good, it's time to contact your, your, your center for the evaluation, which may actually, in most cases, be a face-to-face. -face. And there, obviously, the things that this doesn't capture are uh, changes in blood markers, for example, the ability to do a clinical examination, you know, all of those other things. But what we hope to have is a, is a kind of, look, things are great, or things are on the way down, go to your, your plan A, or contact the, contact the team. And, and by doing so, we hope to provide reassurance and, uh, and direction to both individuals with CF and, and to their care providers in hospital. I'm not sure. And parents. Sorry, yeah, no, I was going to, and that actually leads into the, the next question that just popped up in the chat is about um, what currently is the youngest age this technology is used by and are there plans to make it used from, um, from birth? Um, so, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. The, the, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned briefly, um, we've taken the, the idea of home monitoring and this daily home monitoring to uh, a paediatric uh, population and, and that's Jane Davis is um, leading that study which um, ha is not quite the analysis is not quite finished yet but what is clear at the moment is that there are um, very clear differences in the signals that um, children have from their home monitoring uh, compared to adults and so what we're developing may not be applicable to to young children um, it's possible that we have a, a group of, of kind of teens where they're behaving in a way that's similar to adults um, but we're, we're, we're quite a way away from being able to kind of implement this into into clinical practice in in the pediatric group. Okay thank you. Um, Kirsty was anything you wanted to feed on that or are you? No I mean I, I think uh, the only thing I would say is I guess home monitoring for that kind of, you know, tracking for yourself. Um, we, again, we're not um, rolling out Project Breathe in a paediatric setting at all at the moment. So any, you know, obviously my son is in the paediatric category. So obviously I get him to use it. I think I really hoped it would get something else and nag him instead of me. And that doesn't seem to have helped because I just have to ask him to do his numbers instead. Um, but the, I, there's definitely, there will definitely be value in it also rolling it out to younger children. Um, we just need to understand the best way to do that in terms of the interface and the benefits and how we can integrate that in, um, in their care as well um, to make sure again, it's, it's safe and useful. Um, mm. So it's definitely more work to be done there. Exactly. Okay. 
Um, uh, another question from the chat. Do you think that, and I'm sorry for pronouncing the name of this drug role um, incorrectly, um, do you think taking Cath Trio, uh, the new CF drug, will make a difference to the AI predictions? Well, so that's a great question uh, from Belinda, who's uh, from the CF Trust. So. Oh, just sneaking <laughs> that one in. How did, clearly um, so look, we're in a, <laughs> we're in a terrific uh, position to be able to see the impact of these new wonder therapies on home monitoring because we've got so many people who were part of Project Breathe that have now started the, the triple therapy. So it's really exciting. So this is a key research question for us and we hope to have an answer in the next few months about that. Okay. I guess it's worth saying though that the approach, the platform, the, the general AI uh, solutions um, we see as potentially being transferable to lots of different chronic respiratory conditions, right? So, so the algorithm itself may be different, but the approach we, we expect to be the same. And, and so we're using, in, in one sense, CF as a exemplar for what might be achievable in asthma or CAPD or something else. Um, and certainly um, the beauty of machine learning is it allows us to adapt and develop the algorithm depending on on new things and one of those new things is the, uh, these new drugs so. okay, okay. actually and that leads to the what well, i think it's going to, have to be our final question tonight is how can the search be applied to other health conditions um are, are there any what plans have we got moving forward so at the moment we've our, our, our efforts are focused on CF because we need to develop a system that is, you know, the clinical trial that we can deploy at scale to the population. Um, but once we've done that, then uh, we, we see huge opportunities to leverage what we've learned uh, to other conditions and particularly the passive sensor work that, we, that I mentioned briefly at the end of my talk. And that we, we think may be a big kind of game changer for, for chronic respiratory conditions more generally. Great, thank you. Anything you want to add, Kirsty, in the last couple of seconds? Yeah, no, I mean, I guess the only thing I would say is I think the other um, beauty that we've had in this project is the co-design with people with CF and that constant feedback. And I think um, absolutely we have, we will have something that could benefit other conditions. And, you know, it would be again about making sure we work with the right people to understand what their wants and needs are um, and their care team so that we can get it right for whoever we roll it out to as opposed to just then take it and replicate it which I don't think would work but I think um, I think what we have is, is really exciting and I think the opportunity to um, look to make an impact in other conditions in the future is, is definitely you know exciting times. Lovely. Thank you ever so much, um, both of you, for um, giving up your time tonight and explaining where we are with this project. It, it, it is clearly making a difference to people's lives, and that's what all the things, sorts of things, and the work that and um, the efforts on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus are all about. So it's great to hear. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight as well. I just want to let you know that the next CBC on tour event is all about Cambridge Children's, and it's going to be presented by um, David Rowich on Tuesday, the twenty sixth of January. At back at seven o'clock. Um, so all the information about that is on Eventbrite. Um, so thank you all again, and um, may I take the opportunity to wish you all a, a merry Christmas and uh, and a happy new year to you all as well. So take care. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks.